This is our Q&A series where you get a chance to ask questions live in real time from your favorite artists, producers, industry figures, and other VIPs. Uh, our guest today is Steve Rennie. He's been in the business for a couple years, done a couple different things. Uh, right now, he is the brains behind Ren Man U. Uh, Steve, do you want to uh, start by telling us a little bit about Ren Man U while we give people a chance to, uh, answer, to ask their own questions of you? Sure, sure. First off, let me thank, uh, thank you for having me on the uh, program today and to uh, all my buddies up there in Seattle. I've had a chance to visit up there a couple times. Um, Ren Man U is an online course that I put together with my team here in L.A. Um, that covers all the important areas of the music business, from record labels to publishing to managers and agents and touring. Uh, marketing and promotion and the lot. And uh, it's designed to speak to today's uh, generation of folks. It's 150 video clips covering those 10 major areas of the business. And um, it's, uh, I think, a great, great overview of, uh, of the music business, but with a decidedly real-world perspective of somebody who's actually been doing it for, uh, as Finn said, a couple of years. So when you say a decidedly real-world perspective, how would you say that's different from some of the other perspectives out there? I think, you know, in, you know when you, there's a more academic approach. I and mean, I think there's lots of, unlike when I started in the business, and there was really no other way to learn the music business but by doing it. Today you have all kinds of, of, of ways to do that. In college, you know, where I, when I was in college, there were no music industry programs. Today there are thousands of colleges around the uh, planet that all teach the music business. And so I think what happens when you have that is you're clearly not going to get a thousand people who've worked in the music business teaching those courses. So what that starts to happen is you start leaning on these textbooks, uh, books like the Don Passman's book of music, which is a great resource. There was a book back when I was a kid called This Business of Music. And all of them are great resources, but they tend to focus on more on contractual matters. This is how things are supposed to be. And when you've been a manager, for, for years like I have and worked as a concert promoter and a record exec uh, and so forth, you tend to understand that the way things should be, the way they supposed to look, are not necessarily and more often than not are not what they appear. And so the context and, and experience um, makes a big difference. And the analogy I always use is I'm a big golfer. If you went out on the golf course and uh, – uh, you watch TV on golf. All those pros have a caddy that comes along with them. And part of that job is to give um, some perspective. So, for example, if I'm 150 yards from a green and I'm hitting a shot, whatever club I might hit to go 150 yards, if that green is sitting uphill, the ball won't go as far. So you know, uninitiated person will read the yardage as stated and think that that's what it really is, only to find out later that they were wrong. And I think – uh, the same is true in the music business. So my course um, acts as a uh, professional caddy for aspiring musicians and uh, music professionals. Yeah, so uh, if anyone wants to find out more, uh, redmanu.com is the place to go, right? Correct, correct. Cool. Well, um, I guess I have a, a couple questions for you. Uh, first of all, uh, I guess just to be totally you know, transparent, why are you doing this? You know, you, you, you've had a <laughs> successful career you could stop doing this right now. You'd probably be okay for the rest of your life. Why are you doing this, and why, in particular, are you passionate about education and helping you know the next generation uh, come into the industry? Um, I started, you know, this whole thing. It was not just Redman U. I have a website <clears throat> which you're familiar with called Redman Music and Business, and I started that um, about two and a half years ago to kind of kill time in between the, uh, the lengthening cycles of activity with my former client, Incubus. And uh, so it started as something for fun to help people out because for my whole music business career, I've had people coming up and asking for advice, whether it was my wife or my friend or a caddy, you know, whatever it might be at, a, at the country club. Um, They've all want to know how to get started in music. So I've been doing music business. So I've been doing that kind of uh, informally for years. So I thought it'd be fun to actually do it on a little bit, you know, more um, uh, institutional basis. So I started that website. And uh, that website grew into a web show called Ren Man Live, where we've done 108 webcasts with some of the smartest, you know, most talented folks in the business. Just like we're doing here today, we're giving people an opportunity to uh, not only listen to, but to talk to and actually interact with some of the, with the leaders in the business. 
And, and so I, I do it because I really enjoy talking about the music business. Um, I suppose I could go out and manage another band, but I, I feel like I've had um, my fairy tale ride there. And uh, a little bit of the show business guy in me thinks it's better to walk away <laughs> with the full house, you know. So um, I do it because I love it. That said, it is a lot of work. Uh, what started as a hobby is a lot of work. It took a lot of work and a lot of patience, you know, from my staff in particular to put together our Ren Man U course. And um, and as I do it, you know, uh, you know, there's a little bit more work in than I had in mind, but I still enjoy it, and I love. Uh, I love sharing, you know, the knowledge I have with people that are just starting off. I have a couple of young sons that are just getting in the music business. So even if I stop doing Ren Man U or Ren Man MB, I know I'm going to be sitting in my backyard doing the same speech to all my, my son's young friends who all want to be in the music business as well. Well, I'm waiting for a question to load here. It's been a little bit slow. Um, while I do that, let me ask you, you know, again, you've been doing this for a couple of years. You've been doing Ren Man U now for maybe six or eight months. What's the biggest lesson that you have learned? Um, from the course or from the process? Uh, from, the, from the process. The process, I, I think it's not, it's not a surprise, actually. I, I think it's something that kind of goes without saying. If you want to do something great and you want it to be as good as it can possibly be, uh, it's always ten times more work. 10 times more unexpected things come up than you might have imagined. And, um, and so th that, that has been a reminder. And I say that because people that are looking to do something big in the music business, you know, it's easy to dream about it. It's easy to think about it in your head. And that certainly was the case with our whole mentoring platform. But the reality of making it happen up to the standards you've got in your head, it requires a lot more work and conviction and commitment. And so I suppose this is my reminder in some sick, perverse way uh, for a guy who's represented artists my whole life. Uh, it's my reminder of what it's like to be an artist because I think I've now, you know, fueled with insecurity and fear and we've always wanted to get things perfect and, you know, and all of the things that I kind of fought from the other side of the table as a manager. I'm now becoming that person as the, uh, the host of a web show and a web series and now a, an online course. So I suppose that's my big uh, awakening there. I turned into an artist at the end of the day. Cool. Well, let me ask you a couple specific questions that are coming in here. Uh, first one is, should someone want to work at a label in 2015? And if so, uh, should it be an indie or a major? Uh, that's a good question. I think, you know... Um, I think every, where you want to work in the business um, is really up to you. And I think that I worked at a label for four years, and it was, a, it was an incredibly great experience for me on any number of level, levels. Um, and, and some of the things I learned there um, working at Sony, I was able to use that knowledge as a manager you know, with a band that was on Sony. So it was, it was very instructive. We just had a big-time record exec on our web show, Red Man Live, this past Wednesday, a guy by the name of Aaron Bayshook, who's the head of A&R. He's a music fan, went to work at a label, and he's only ever worked in the music business as a record label person. And he seems to be enjoying it quite a bit. I think Back when I started in the business, the, the, the role of the labels and the weight and the stick and the, the, the presence that they had, I think, was stronger than it was in today's world because there was very little of this independent scene. And without the Internet, there was a very tried and true structure about how you delivered records, when you delivered them, and so forth and so on. And the Internet has turned all of that stuff upside down. So to the question of should, if you want to work at a label, should you work at a major label or an independent label? Um, if the independent label is your only option, I say go work at an independent label. If the independent label is you and your buddy um, in your college dorm, um, you'll learn some lessons there, but you'd probably learn more lessons working at a bigger indie. So is it in, the independent labels could be doing $100 million a year. So my point would being that if you want to work in the real music business, which means making really big stars, not little ones that nobody knows about, then working in, in the 
where the action is is important. And because for a couple of reasons, one, you'll get a sense of how things really work versus that kind of academic uh, approach or that kind of, you know, I wish it was like this approach. Um, that's hugely important. But more importantly, I think you get a chance to work around people that have had experience that have worked in the business that are able to sift out what's real and what's not very fast. And what that does is it provides you kind of a pseudo mentorship in the sense that you get fast tracked by hanging around with smarter, more experienced people than yourself. So um, when you have a chance to play with the big boys and girls, I say take it um, because that's how you learn fast, by hanging out with smarter, more talented people and more experienced. Uh, I have a, a personal question for you, which is something that I know that you have a little bit of experience with. You know, one of the, the tricky things in the music business is that oftentimes people uh, say they're going to do something and then end up not doing it, either because, you know, they changed their mind or, more, or, or, or maybe they're a liar, or more often than not, they're just flaky and, and they had every intention of doing it, but they just didn't for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you sort of address that while preserving the longer term relationship? Um, are you talking about with artists or or business or folks? Any, any, any of the any of the above, but just one of these people where you didn't do yeah. what you said you were going to do. I I kind of want to call you out on it, but I also want to preserve the relationship. How do I do that? Well, uh, I'll tell you with my own personal experience. <clears throat> um, I, if you told me you were going to do something, and I say this to my young sons all the time, the most important thing, most important asset you have in the business world is not necessarily your degree at the end of the day, it's your credibility. And that when you tell somebody you're going to do something and you don't do it, you put doubt in their mind. And perhaps you can get away with that once, but you won't get away with it twice with me. Okay, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt once. Second time, it's habitual and I'm out. And so the impact is if you don't take care of business, people stop working with you. Now, I said I started with the business types. It's also true on the artist side. That was a, a constant conversation I had with my friends in Incubus, not just Incubus, but every client I had, which is, you know, think about what you commit to carefully and consider it from all the different options. Because if you say you're going to do it, you better freaking do it or people in your weakest moments will choose not to work with you, right? And in your weakest moments is when you need the most help, right? If you've got the world you know, screaming at your feet and you've got a big hit record, you can get away with all kinds of stupidity. But that is a temporary state of being. You, know, you might get there frequently, but those are fleeting moments when everything is on your side. And if you don't take care of business in those great moments, you'll have no chance of anybody helping you in your worst moments. So for all you folks out there watching, artists or professional, understand it very clearly. Your willing or your ability to say yes and deliver is everything we got a saying around the office here i said if you want to be a hero to me i say do you say done and that's the only conversation i want to hear and that's what keeps you working in the business world not just the music business so what about when you don't do what you said you were going to do how do i you know as as someone that has to work with you how do i how do I kind of say, hey, Steve, you didn't, you didn't do what you said you were going to do. What's up? You know, look, I'm, I'm, uh, all of us have that in them, right? And, um, and people that know me will call me on the mat, okay? And, and, and for people that have some sense of consciousness about that, that pact you make with people, they already know, <laughs> okay? So a whisper will get my attention. A look will get my attention because I'm the first person that knows. And uh, while I have my moments of weakness, just like everybody else, um, if we were keeping score, <clears throat> you know, and we were, and it was a thousand at bats. It's well into the nine nineties on the, you know, if he says he's going to do it, um, I'm betting that he's going to do it. Yeah. Um, okay. Another, uh, another question here. Um, say you've got a, a couple kind of along the same lines and this is one I hear a lot. So I'm going to kind of sum them all up. You hear this a lot is there's people who say, I want to, I want to work in the music industry. And then you go, okay, well, what do you do? And they're like, I, I don't care. I'll do anything. What would you say to that person? Well, you know, there's a lesson in, in our course uh, that deals specifically with that. And it's called, you know, finding your target, right? Or picking a target. 
And um, you're exactly right. Too, so often people say, well, I'll do anything in the music business, you know, from the business point of view, right? Or artists will go, look, I just want to be famous. You know, I, I, I don't really care. And it's a bad place to get yourself to because of one important reason. If you're just shooting into to the wild blue yonder, um, hitting a target will be accidental versus if I'm deciding to aim at a tree and I've got a you know, BB gun or something, something that won't kill anybody, and I aim at the tree and I hit it, then I know I'm on target. I know I'm doing the right things. If I aim at the tree and hit you know, the dog across the street, he runs off yelping, that, that's a problem. But it's real feedback and tells me, wow, I need to get more over here. So whatever, it's okay to start, I think, early on in your career going, I just love to do something in music business. I'm not quite sure what that is. So I'd like to just get started and, and, and then see where that might lead me. I think that is okay in the beginning because when you first start off, you don't have any particular skill set uh, that would help you get targeted. By, but getting into the business somewhere, right? Maybe you're thinking, I love going to concerts. So you start as a security guard at a, at a venue during the summer as a summer gig, right? And then you hear that there's an internship to be a runner backstage at a concert. And, and then maybe as a runner, you meet a manager. And all of a sudden, you sit there and go, well, I like being a runner and I like working here. But I like the way that guy deals with bands. And I think, you know what? I think I'd like to be a manager. That process of starting wide and then narrowing your target is realistic and, and probably real in the real world. But you should be thinking about your target. And back to those golfing analogies, the best thing is the smallest, most clearly defined target you can get, the tighter the better, uh, I find. And um, that would be my advice to folks. You know, if you're starting wide, figure out how to tighten it up quick. Get to the zoom button. And yeah, and let me tell you why I don't like that I'll do anything approach is because if I go to you and say, I want to I want to work, I want to work for you, I'll do anything, then really I'm not offering you a solution. I, I'm giving you a problem, which is yeah. find a place for me. Yes. You know, and you're like, I I've yeah. I've got I've already got enough on my plate. The last thing I want to spend my time on is figuring yeah. out writing your job description. I should yeah. come to you and say, Steve, this is what I'm awesome at. I want to do it for you starting tomorrow. And you can say yes or no, but yeah. I should have a specific you know, proposal for you. I think that is 100% spot on because uh, if you make people think too much, um, you're likely to lose them. If you, come, if you become a problem solver, you know, problem identifier and solver, then you have instant value to me. Otherwise, I'm a problem. Yeah, or at least something else to think about. And most busy people got plenty to think about. Uh, well, so here's here's another question. Uh, you know, the music industry is not known for uh, you know being the most lucrative. You know, there's a few people that end up getting rich, but you know, for the most part, it's not the most lucrative. Why would a really smart, driven person want to work in the music industry instead of at a big corporation where they might make more money with less BS? Well, I'll start with the obvious one. It's a lot more fun when it works, right? Um, but you hit on, on, on a real kind of one of the deep, dark secrets of the music business for people to just get involved. I will say it's an incredibly lucrative business beyond what might be fair or normal or sane for a very select few. And I'm talking about artists right now, right? Um, the, the real state of being for artists in particular is you're either nowhere, Reed, I'm struggling, I don't have any money, I've got to keep a day gig to, to, to support what amounts to a hobby, or you're ridiculously successful, you know, pick your poison, Rihanna or Beyonce or Jay-Z. There is really very little middle ground in between, and I think the internet has given some hope um, that, that a middle ground or a middle class of musicians might uh, actually uh, develop but I think it's mostly um, aspirational rather than realistic at this point, right? On the business side, a little bit different, right? If you can get a job working in the music business, you know, at one of those, and there's plenty of big corporations in the music business, all that, that list is shrinking a bit, right? Um, working for a big record label will provide you all of the same 
benefits I think that you would get at any big corporation, right? You know, you're still going to have to start at the bottom. You're still going to have to work your way up to the top. Um, and it'll provide you, um, you know, it can provide you a nice living. And I know lots of people that have worked 25, 30 years at a record label, right? But there aren't those many, there aren't that many of those jobs either, right? So it's something that I think about all the time because even in my mentoring, uh, world that I've created for myself now. Um, one of the big attractions of that for me is the internet and this ability to broadcast. And we've talked about it on, on Creative Live before how this ability for people to, to have something to share and, and, and a willingness to share it, they have new platforms to go out and make their case. And, uh, and for me, that's really exciting stuff. you know. And so for people that are just starting today, somebody has asked me the other day, would you go in the music business today, Steve, if you were just starting? And I tell them I, I would probably be leaning more to doing something on the tech side of things, you know, um, because it is the Wild West and it is the, 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 the crazy frontier out there. It's kind of there. the same dynamics that attracted you to the music industry, but yeah. with a lot more big scores left. Bang. That's where there are some big scores out there still. But that said, when you look at the number of big scores versus the number of startups that come out of Silicon Valley and everywhere else, I'm willing to bet you when all said and done, it's not much different than the music business. While we all focus on Facebook and Instagram and, you know, the, the, this week's flavor, Snapchat, let's see if they get to the finish line, right? Um, there are thousands of internet startups and PowerPoints floating around that will never raise a dollar or, or, or make a successful business. So the odds are probably about the same of succeeding. But, God, if you get it right whew, in the tech world, man, it's breathtaking, the yeah. scores. You can't sell enough records to make a billion dollars. We're working on it. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, another question. Uh, you talk a lot about timing and lighting, which is something along the lines of being in the right place at the right time. How can you help yourself be in the right place at the right time? Well, first of all, you can figure out uh, where the scoring zone is in your world, right? So if you're sitting out, and, and I don't want to pick on anybody that's sitting in a small city. My wife grew up in a small city. But if you're sitting out in Podunk, thinking about working at a record company or working at a major agency or working for a major promoter, uh, I'll just go out on a limb and say you are not in the scoring zone where something can happen, right? So the first thing you can do is getting the scoring zone. So if you're thinking about the music business in the United States, that means you're going to Nashville or New York or L.A. or perhaps Austin, but certainly one of the major areas where there is a music scene. It would be London and in the, in the U.K. or in Europe and Australia down in, in the other part of the world. Um, that's the first thing you can do, right, is get in the scoring area. Timing and lighting is, you know, about being in the right place at the right time, but there's one important element that you didn't mention, which is that you have to be ready to go when that timing and lighting is ready for you. If you hesitate, if you show insert uncertainty or, or fear or insecurity makes you stop for a minute when your moment is there, trust me, somebody else who's more prepared will be there to take your spot. So it's about getting in the scoring zone, being conscious of looking for that moment. But when your moment comes, you can't be auditioning, you can't be rehearsing, you have to actually just get out there and kill it. And you never know when that moment's going to come. So that means you're always cocked and loaded, which is, which is, it gives you tension, it gives you fear, it, it kind of fuels all of it. Is my moment going to come, right? And so that's what timing and lighting is about. Be prepared when your moment comes. Uh, I remember one of my old uh, kickboxing coaches used to say, uh, you know, they talk in fights, like, oh, he won, but it was a lucky punch, you know, and he would, uh, he'd always say, it's funny, the more, the, the more I train, the luckier I get. It's true. It's absolutely true. When you and I are done today, I'm going to go out and work on my golf game, Copa, I get lucky this weekend. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, we're running out of time, uh, so I'll let you go, but thanks so much for joining us. Uh, you can help her head over to renmanu.com uh, to learn more about uh, Steve's online education ventures. Highly encourage you to do so. Uh, not only educational, but also entertaining. And also check out renmanmb.com. Uh, watch every single, you got a hundred some episodes of that web show. 108 now. Yeah. yeah, if you're interested in the music business, uh, definitely watch all of those. Have them on in the background while you're doing something else. 
You'll learn a lot. They're also really fun. Uh, so check that out. And uh, Steve, hope to see you soon. Good. Thanks, Ben. Always a pleasure, my friend. Talk to you later.